Oh, that's bad. So I spent the last few months collecting six of some of the rarest, wackiest smartphones you've ever seen. And each of them has a very different vision of what the future's gonna be. So number six is the Moto Z. And you know how smartphones now are like eight, nine millimeters, like 7.5 on a really good day? Well, this is 5.2. It's one of the thinnest smartphones in the world ever. Because it's easy to forget that just a few years ago, that was the game. That was what companies thought the future was. Wow. Oh my God. I'm gonna be honest with you. Holding this in my hands right now, I get it. Like this doesn't even feel real. It feels like something's missing. It just so happens that for smartphones, being thin stopped being cool. Go back seven years and every company was just out there trying to make every design slimmer than the last. I remember the day when if a company released a phone that was thicker than their last model, people would be like, what are you doing? They'd get booed off stage. It would look like they were moving backwards. So really, it was just a matter of time before someone had durability problems. And the iPhone 6 and iPhone 6 Plus were those phones. If you put enough pressure on the chassis, they could be bent in half. So almost overnight, the appeal of thin phones vanished. And so even though I am literally sitting here gawping at this phone, by the time the Moto Z came out, no one cared about thinness. Okay, phone number two. You know when I say the word foldable phone right now, you probably think of the Samsung Galaxy Z Fold 2 or the Motorola Razr, but just a few years ago, you would have thought of something closer to this. The ZTE Axon M. What ZTE thought at the time was the future. Ooh, it's actually pretty nice packaging. I guess as you'd expect, given that this was one of the most expensive phones you could buy at the time. And I will say that with this phone, there were a lot of good decisions made. These stickers not being one of them. The dual screen meant that you could run two apps at the same time in full screen. Cool. It could be used as a book with the bezel serving as a divider in the middle. Also cool. Plus, like, listen to this hinge. Ah. Oh. So why didn't this take off? Well, just like for current foldables in 2020, I think it's because people didn't really need it. Android in its entirety has been built around being able to do everything with just one normal size display. And because of that, up until this point, foldables have just basically been hardware companies deciding that they want to build a foldable, and then afterwards trying to find reasons why an average consumer might want one, as opposed to there being an inherent problem that needs fixing. They talked about how you can have two different videos playing at the same time, but given that you can only listen to one of them at any one point, how useful is that? I guess like if you had two different sporting events that just so happened to be streamed at the same time and you only wanted to listen to one of them, maybe? But it's a bit of a stretch. They showed off how you can use one screen to mirror what's happening on the other. Why would I want to mirror what's happening on one phone screen on another phone screen that's sitting right next to it? So yeah, while I do believe in foldables, I really want to do that again, until one comes out that either isn't noticeably more expensive than a normal phone or one that can actually solve a pain point that currently exists, I don't think they'll fly. And along a very similar line of dual screen devices, this is the Yota 3 Plus. It's the last phone ever made by the Yota company, who tried to take over the smartphone market by providing people with one normal display on the front and one e-ink on the back. I kind of spectated this company for a while from a distance. I never actually got the phones, but I've been fascinated by them. So it's kind of crazy that right now in front of us, we have the most advanced model they ever created. It's stunning packaging as well. It looks like something you'd keep in a library. It actually is a book. Wow. That's such an interesting way to present something. Let's just see if there's anything else interesting in here. Yeah, it's pretty standard. Say what you will about the Yota company, but these guys had a vision. These guys really believed in e-ink, and I can see it. I can see the power of it. Instead of using a traditional display for which each pixel needs to be individually and continuously lit, e-ink just basically pushes around these tiny little capsules of color into whatever formation needed. And once they're in formation, not a single watt of power is consumed. And so if I drew something on an e-ink display, I could leave it on there for a year, and it would probably still be there when I came back. Plus, as a side benefit, do you know how normally your phone's display kind of fights with the sunlight? E-ink becomes more readable with sunlight. Imagine being able to do smartphone things like Google Maps navigation on a display that sips almost no power. It's tantalizing. But do you wanna know the problem with this idea? It's the fact that it's Android. See, with something like a Kindle, you can actually squeeze incredible battery life out of an e-ink display. But Android is a high power consumption operating system. So even if you use your e-ink display, which uses a fraction of the power of your normal one, the rest of your phone, which is like 70% of your power usage, is still carrying on as normal. Your GPS, your data connection, 
your background apps, none of that stops. So you could probably imagine that the battery saving, the kind of main selling point of this whole concept, was not as revolutionary as initially claimed. And I've got a full video which actually talks about the mess that the Yota company got into, but for now, you can see why the concept failed. Okay, augmented reality, you probably have noticed, has been getting slightly better every year, slowly becoming something that, dare I say, is actually useful. Well, Google had this exact vision back in 2014. They saw that AR was going to be huge, and so they built an entire protocol to let companies build phones that were able to use it. Phones that were able to detect their exact position relative to the world around them. Google called it Project Tango. They basically said to companies, look, if you put these particular sensors on your phone in this particular way, then you can be Project Tango certified, and you'll be compatible with this upcoming world of AR. And Asus is one of the few companies that listened. This is actually one of the two devices ever released to support Project Tango, the Zenfone AR. So actually on the side, you can see the Project Tango sticker there. It's quite a rare one. Surprise screen protector. Oh, it's actually a glass screen protector. Very fancy. You can tell that Asus, you know, really put some care and love into this. Like, these are some nice looking earphones. There's something else in here as well. It's just a hard plastic case. On the face of it, the failure of Project Tango is confusing. It was backed by Google themselves. You can see why it's useful. And we use AR today. If Google already built this in 2014, then surely the AR we have today is based on that. Well, no, it's actually quite funny. So shortly after coming out with Project Tango and telling developers to start adopting it into their phones, Google realized that they could actually do the same thing without those extra sensors. And they ended up calling it AR Core. And that's what a lot of phones use today, which as you can probably imagine is not good news for Project Tango phones. I'm saving the best two till the end. This is a phone right here that I've been wanting to unbox since I saw it get announced back in 2013. This is the LG G Flex. Now, unlike the name suggests, it's not actually a flexible phone, unfortunately. But, see, it's curved. This phone is a perfect example of how in 2013, smartphone makers, they didn't have as much of a, a template as to how they needed to make their phone. The concept is actually quite simple. Your hands, your palms, are curved. Your face is curved. So let's build something that fits around it. I could totally imagine LG sitting there in a boardroom, scratching their heads thinking, this might be what people want. Maybe? Let's try it. Oh yeah, and the material LG ended up picking for the back of the phone heals itself. It has an atomic arrangement such that it sits in a really stable equilibrium. And if you disrupt that equilibrium slightly, it can bring itself back into equilibrium. In theory, at least. But let's try it. I'm just gonna give it a good old scratch with this knife. It's a, it's a very sharp blade. Don't wanna do this. It's a really rare phone. <laughs> okay. Oh no. Oh, that's bad. Okay, take a look at that. Really quite a clear scratch. I'm gonna give it a rub and see what happens. 12 seconds later. I think the thing to take from this is that it's not amazing. However, what makes this better is the fact that we have a second phone, the LG G Flex 2. And the cool part about this is they basically took the self-healing capabilities of the first phone and supposedly made it better. It could supposedly heal in seconds as opposed to minutes and just be able to heal more damage. It's almost psychedelic looking packaging. And you can see they've actually adopted the curve of the phone in the box itself. That's, that's a cool touch. Okay, okay, so we've got the phone and nothing of interest. So compared to the first model, it's actually a lot smaller and just kind of generally subtler in design. And the curve looks about the same in terms of how pronounced that is. But more importantly, let's give it a scratch. Okay, so nice big old scratch on there. I feel like I'm doing a magic trick. Okay, well, it feels, it feels like it's lighter. There is some improvement. You can definitely see that the scratch seems less deep. It would have been really interesting to see how much LG could have improved this with future generations. Let's say they made four or five more LG G Flex phones. The place it could be at now would actually be impressive. So why did self-healing phones disappear? Because surely if they perfected that technique, that sounds like a dream. Well, it's because glass came. Apple had already used glass for quite some time on their phones, but as soon as Samsung made the switch with their Galaxy S6s, it kind of pushed all the reluctant Android phone makers to follow suit. 
They knew that they wouldn't be able to make a phone that felt as premium as Samsung's by only relying on plastics. And on that note, I'd be curious what you think. What would be your ideal smartphone finish? Plastic, glass, metal, wood, something else? Let me know. Anyway, if you enjoyed this video, a sub to the channel would be amazing. My name is Aaron, this is Mr. Who's the Boss, and I'll catch you in the next one.